Dabamaru was born in a ruthless ninja village, where people are trained in assassination techniques from a young age. His parents didn't want him to have that fate and decided to leave the village while he was still a baby. However, the leader of the clan found out about their plan and clapped them. At that moment, the leader decided to raise Gabamaru and turn him into the strongest immortal ninja. The leader always told him that emotions make a person weak, and unless one is strong, they can't protect anything, especially precious things. His village was notorious for producing the world's strongest ninjas through brutal methods. Due to this training, Gabamaru developed superhuman abilities, making him capable of breaking blades with his body. Over the years, he earned the nickname Hollow for his emotionless and efficient clapping but he despised his immortality and the countless people he had deleted. However, Gabamaru was still their biggest prodigy and was regarded as the next leader of the clan. Therefore, the current leader decided to marry his daughter to Gabamaru. At first, Gabamaru didn't like her because she was too innocent, but she supported him and made him happy. He fell in love with her and she felt the same way. They just wanted to live a peaceful life without worrying about one of them dying. So, Gabamaru told the leader he didn't want to be a ninja anymore. But that leader was really mean. He even hurt his own daughter's face so she wouldn't want a normal life. At first, he agreed to let Gabamaru go under the condition to perform one last mission. But he then betrayed Gabamaru and called him a traitor. They sentenced Gabamaru to only wake up again in his next life. They asked him if he had any last words. Gabamaru said he didn't have anything to say. Then, the person with the sword tried to do his job, but something strange happened. The sword couldn't cut. No matter how hard they pressed the sword against his neck, it couldn't clap him. The executioner couldn't do it and got frustrated and tried harder, but the sword just broke. This surprised the leader, who wanted to see a show. Gabamaru feels really frustrated because he knows he can't die. The person who was supposed to clap off his head can't believe it. Finally, we see the face of the white-haired boy, who is Gabamaru. Gabamaru starts wondering why he can't die or, to put it better, why he won't die. He's pretty sad about it because he doesn't care about being alive. He's done some really bad things, and that's why he doesn't want to live anymore. While he talks about this, we can see him thinking about all the people he's hurt, and it's a really sad moment. Then, a lady comes to talk to Gabamaru. He's locked up in a cell, all chained up. The lady starts telling us some things about Gabamaru. She says it's no surprise he's super strong because they trained him like crazy in the village. When they talk about his abilities, Gabamaru says he doesn't need fancy fighting moves to beat people. The lady gets interested and asks if he can do ninja stuff. Gabamaru says he can, but when she asks him to show her, he says no. After that, the leader guy orders his men to burn Gabamaru alive because he's done a lot of bad stuff. They pile up hay and set it on fire. Gabamaru is tied to a pole, and we know he won't die. The fire doesn't hurt him at all. When he opens his eyes, the leader guy is really mad because nothing they do works on Gabamaru. Gabamaru gets chained up again and tells the lady that he doesn't want to live forever. He just wants to die already. The lady, who's been writing stuff down, doesn't even turn around. She says she doesn't care and that her job is to document what's happening with Gabamaru. Gabamaru feels cold and asks for some clothes, but the lady is too busy with her writing to help him. Gabamaru lets out a sigh and says his story isn't all that interesting, but the lady tells him she has to hear it anyway. Later, she starts asking lots of questions about his life. Gabamaru says he never knew his parents because the leader of his village got rid of them and adopted him. We see a really sad scene where the leader clapped Gabamaru's parents right in front of him when he was just a baby. Then, she asks if he has any dreams or goals. He says no because he's an assassin and all he has to do is get rid of the people they tell him to. We see a flashback where he's holding a severed head, showing he's used to doing bad stuff. The lady asks him one more question. She wants to know how they caught him since he can't die. Gabamaru says he wanted to run away from the village, but his friends turned on him and trapped him. He adds that leaving the village is a big no-no, and he doesn't complain about what happened. She asks why he wanted to leave in the first place, but we don't find out because the story changes. Next, the leader guy, the Shogun, goes a bit crazy. He wants to try to clap Gabamaru in half this time. He tells his guys to use oxen to do it. But as we expected, Gabamaru's body can handle it, and the oxen get tired and fall down. Gabamaru feels let down once again and the Shogun gets really mad because he's not looking so good as an executioner. He tells them to get more oxen to try again. Meanwhile, the lady comes up to Gabamaru and says all of this seems weird. Gabamaru asks if she means his ninja body, but she says she's talking about what he's saying. She finds it strange that he says he wants to stop existing but didn't just let the animals pull him apart. It doesn't make sense. And if he doesn't care about living, why did he try to escape? 
That's what she wants to know. She asks him to answer the question she asked yesterday because he didn't really answer it before. But suddenly, Gabamaru changes. He doesn't look calm anymore, he looks like he's ready to fight. The Shogun comes over and tells the lady to forget about writing stuff down and just get rid of Gabamaru as soon as possible. But she says she has to do her job. One of the Shogun's guys comes with the oxen, but she's not interested. All she wants is to finish her report about Gabamaru. So, Gabamaru decides to answer her question because it doesn't matter anymore. He says that in the village of Iwagakyor, he was the best assassin and got to the highest rank. The village leader thought Gabamaru was so good that he offered him his daughter's hand in marriage. But when they got married, he found out she was totally different from what he expected. Even though she grew up around clappers, she was really kind, religious, and not very knowledgeable about the world. Gabamaru got used to this life, and his ninja skills got rusty. So, he decided to quit being a ninja and run away from her. At first, the village leader seemed reasonable and asked him to do one last mission. But, of course, it was a trick. Gabamaru got caught, and he gave up, which led to his current situation where he's waiting to see what will happen to him. During the night, the lady learns that they call Gabamaru Gabamaru the Hollow because he claps his rivals without showing any emotion. But that's not all, she hears a story about how Gabamaru fought off 20 guys sent to arrest him and beat them all. This doesn't make sense because he's supposed to want to die, but he's been resisting it. Gabamaru wonders why he's been fighting to stay alive if he's supposed to be empty, and not care about anything. He decides that next time, he won't fight it. The next day, they decide to clap Gabamaru by boiling him in oil. But even that doesn't work. The Shogun gets scared when he sees it doesn't hurt Gabamaru. But then, the lady tells him it's time, and they take Gabamaru to a room. When they get there, Gabamaru meets the lady who was writing down his story. Her name is Yamada Asiman Sajiri, and she's a super skilled swordswoman from the Yamada clan. These folks are known for being great with swords and for being executioners. Sajiri tries to chop Gabamaru's head off, and he realizes she's really good. For a tiny moment, he thinks his head is gone. So, he tries to dodge her, but she still manages to scratch his neck a little, and that's when he starts worrying about his life. Then, Sajiri tells him she was writing his story so they could properly get rid of him. She says Gabamaru is empty inside, but he actually still wants to live because he loves his wife. He's been pretending to want to die. But that's not what he really wants. Then Gabamaru gets mad and takes out a sword to attack Sajiri. They have a big fight, but Gabamaru manages to dodge her attacks. Finally, she stops and shows him a paper from the Shogunate. It says that if he helps them, they'll drop all the charges against him, and he won't be sentenced to die. Plus, because the Shogunate is super powerful, his old village can't chase after him anymore. But there's a catch. To get this protection, he has to go to something called Paradise on Earth. They just found a place like that not too long ago. In this place, there's something called the Elixir of Life. If you drink it, you can live forever. But here's the thing, lots of soldiers went looking for it, and they all came back as flowers. Yep, flowers. So, the big boss people decide to send bad guys like Gabamaru to go look for it this time. They figure maybe criminals will have better luck. Sajiri, the lady with the sword, says her job is to find the toughest criminals who still want to live. Gabamaru hears this and says yes to the deal because he wants that protection to get back to his wife. But then, the shogun in charge of the prison says he won't let Gabamaru escape. Right then, Gabamaru asks Sajiri if she still wants to see his ninja magic, and she says yes. In a snap, Gabamaru does a fire ninja move and uses his powers to get rid of all the guards who are trying to stop him. After that, he sets a goal to find the elixir of life so he can go back to his wife, who's waiting for him at home. Sajiri remembers a time when she saw her dad do an execution. She was surprised because the guy who was gonna get his head chopped off wanted to die, but he told a funny story first. After a little while, her dad, who was the executioner, clapped the guy in such a perfect way that the guy didn't even notice his head was gone. He finished his story, and that was that. Sajiri thought it was amazing, and she wanted to do it just like her dad. She wanted to make it so quick and painless that the person didn't feel a thing. When she grew up and became an executioner, she was really good at it. She made it look like the person's body was soft like butter. Lots of people praised her for how good she was, but she was scared. She had nightmares about the people she clapped trying to grab her, and she didn't like that at all. In her memories, there's a guy with red hair and an eye patch who gave her advice. He said her executions had fear and doubt, which made the people feel pain. Her sword wasn't doing the job right. She said she'd try to get better, and we see her practicing and clapping another person. But she still felt scared and hesitated. Then, the red-haired guy told her to look at her sword's blade. 
when she did, she was shocked because she could see the person's painful face. This gave her terrible visions where the dead folks tried to get her because they couldn't rest in peace. Sajiri just wanted them to feel nothing, no pain, no hate, nothing like that. Sajiri's executions aren't perfect, so the souls of the people she clapped try to grab her. She keeps doing her job, but she can't reach her dad's level because she has doubts about her executions. Then, they put a blindfold on Gabamaru's face, and it looks like they're gonna get rid of him. They blindfold the criminals so they can't see the shogunate because they're not supposed to. They end up by the coast, where the shogunate's people set up a tent with no roof to gather the criminals. Gabamaru and Sajiri are already inside. The shogunate's guys formally welcome the criminals and say they'll get to see the ruler. But, like I said before, their faces are covered, so they can't see the big boss. This makes the criminals mad, and they get frustrated. Sajiri checks out the criminals' backgrounds and sees that they've done really bad stuff. If they ever got out, it would be chaos. But then, Gabamaru complains that he can't breathe and wants to see the ruler in person. Sajiri tells him to hush. Then, the officer tells them the secret mission. They have to go to paradise and bring back the elixir of life. If they do that, they'll get official forgiveness and be free. This makes the criminals excited, and one of them even says he's gonna commit more crimes once he's pardoned. Sajiri wonders if she can get rid of a bad person without feeling bad because they're gonna die anyway. She hopes it won't haunt her. Then, there's a lady named Yusuriha behind Gabamaru. She recognizes him and says he's a famous assassin who's really good at claping. But she's disappointed because he doesn't look like what people say he does. Sajiri watches everything and wonders if Gabamaru is just like the other criminals, or maybe even worse. She says she used to keep an eye on him, but ever since he agreed to go on this quest for the elixir of life, he doesn't seem interested in anything. Then she uses her sword to check things out and sees something creepy. After that, a guy from the Shogunate talks about the island they have to go to. He says it's kinda like paradise on earth. But the criminals don't believe it, and they start making noise because they think they're being lied to. They're told to take off their masks, and they see something really weird. A guy sitting there with flowers growing out of his body. The spokesman says he's the only one who survived a recent trip to the island, and 60 other people disappeared. This freaks everyone out. The death row convicts start feeling scared because they're looking at a dead body covered in flowers. The officials try to calm them down and say the flowers are a special blessing. But the prisoners don't like being treated like they don't understand. Then, one of the kingdom's officers yells that they're gonna die anyway, so they should be happy to die in a pretty way. But the criminals don't want anything to do with going to Paradise Island because it's super risky, and there's no guarantee they'll come back alive. The authorities hope the convicts will appreciate this chance, but they don't seem convinced. One of them even doubts if the elixir of life even exists. An official says they can leave if they want, but when one guy tries, an executioner claps him. Back to the speech, they say each criminal will have a monitor to watch them, and those monitors are the executioners. They warn the criminals that they'll be watched closely, and if they break any rules, they can still be clapped on the island. Sajiri is assigned as Gabamaru's partner and she puts her sword near his neck. The spokesperson says that if anything happens to the criminals' monitors, the Yamada clan will clap them when they come back. Gabamaru seems pretty calm, and Sajiri wonders if he's brave or just doesn't get how serious this is. Then, the shogunate talks to the spokesperson and whispers something to him before saying they're getting ready to leave. Next, the spokesperson says they have to reduce the number of criminals because there's only so much space on the ship and not enough monitors. One of the convicts gets it and claps another to show what the official means. The official says anyone who dies wouldn't have been useful anyway, and they can't untie their hands. So, the criminals start fighting each other, and the shogunate is watching, like he's enjoying the show. That was one of his goals. In the middle of all this, the shogunate wants to know who has red seals, which means they're the most dangerous criminals. The official says there's a group of super strong people among the criminals, like Gabamaru and some others. Then, a guy with an eye patch, Izan, talks to Sajiri. He says that even though there's violence here, what they'll face on the island is gonna be way worse. He says it's not just the convicts who will suffer, but the executioners too. Izan tells Sajiri that she's not really cut out to be an executioner because she hesitates when she's doing it. He thinks she should be living peacefully in her mansion instead of wielding a sword. Izan says Sajiri can't handle the guilt and the souls of her victims. Sajiri gets frustrated but says even when she's at home, her family's known for being executioners, and it's not easy. She remembers how she was bullied because of her family's job when she was young, and one day, she decided to face it. 
there's a scene where she kinda pulls out a sword, and that's when she first deals with the executioner's karma. Sajiri tells Izan that even with the tough stuff, she wants to be a warrior and will do whatever it takes. Meanwhile, some of the criminals realize they might all die if things keep going like this, so they decide to team up and try to escape from the samurai guards. They figure Sajiri might be an easy target because she's a woman. Izan gets ready to stop them, but Sajiri steps up and says she'll handle it. She draws her sword and quickly takes out her attackers. But she hesitates, and it's clear from the heads she clapped off that they felt pain. This makes Sajiri feel bad because she feels like the dead are on her. Gabamaru says no one can stay calm when they take someone's life, and that gets everyone's attention. Gabamaru sneaks up on the shogunate without anyone noticing, and the guards are really surprised. Gabamaru doesn't want a massacre, so he suggests a less violent way to choose who goes to paradise. He says if they keep fighting like this, everyone will be gone. One of the guards tells a convict to clap Gabamaru, and if he does, he'll get a free pass. The guy gets ready to fight Gabamaru, who doesn't want to clap anyone, but the guy won't back down. Gabamaru feels bad but says if he has no choice, he'll have to fight. So, they start fighting but Gabamaru is surprisingly peaceful about it. He gets close to the guy and quickly claps him, even though his hands are tied. The other convicts try to attack Gabamaru, but he defends himself really well. And by really well, I mean he might have broken some necks, spines, and butts. After all that violence, Gabamaru is covered in blood, and everyone's terrified. They all think he's a monster, but Sajiri sees something more. She notices that the souls of Gabamaru's victims are way more numerous than hers. She can't even imagine how much he must be tormented after clapping his opponents so brutally. Sajiri has a big realization after watching Gabamaru. She understands that she doesn't have to get rid of her fear. Instead, she should accept the feelings and consequences that come with what she does, just like Gabamaru does. Izan asks her one more time if she's ready for the job, and she says she is. Then, the officials tell everyone who's going on the trip to Paradise Island. Gabamaru is one of them, but there are others too. Their names are Aza Chobai, Tamiya Gantitsusai, Twisted Kayun, Nyurugai, Horubo, Akajinu, Yuzuriha, Moromakia, and Rokirota. There are 10 members in total, and each one will have an executioner watching them. They all get on a ship, and after a journey, they finally reach Paradise Island. When Gabamaru sees the place, he's surprised by the special feeling it has. As Gabamaru approached the mysterious island, he recalled a strange memory from his village. He remembered his village leader demonstrating something unbelievable to the clan members. They attacked him with all sorts of weapons, causing many severe injuries, but the leader just kept on grinning in a sinister way. They said it was because of some medicine he got from a faraway land across the sea. It made them think he drank the elixir of life. Gabamaru shared this story with Sajiri, but she wasn't so sure about it. She had her doubts, so he told her that he also thought it was impossible at first, but he later found out it was true. Though, he admitted that he wasn't certain they could find the elixir of life on this supposed paradise island. As they walked through the densely overgrown surroundings, checking out the place, Sajiri was amazed by everything she saw. She even started thinking that maybe the elixir of life was hidden there. But Gabamaru stopped and had a different view. He said the place felt somewhat creepy to him, and he had no clue about the dangers they might encounter. Gabamaru decided to take off his restraints, but Sajiri told him he couldn't do that. He argued that it was crazy to explore an unknown place with his hands tied. However, she was determined to follow the shogunate's instructions and keep him under control. Her job was to watch over him and make sure he followed the rules. She gave him a new rope to tie his own hands. Gabamaru began to voice his concerns about the odds being stacked against them. He told her they only had three days worth of food and water, and the only clue they had about the elixir of life was a random drawing. He started to doubt if the shogunate really wanted to find the elixir. Sajiri had enough of his complaints and swiftly drew her sword toward his neck. She made it clear that she was an executioner, not his companion. She told him that if he refused her orders, she would simply chop off his head. Dabamaru reluctantly followed Sajiri's instructions and tied his own hands. As he did so, he reminded himself that he was doing all of this to reunite with his wife, so he was willing to accept and fulfill this condition. But suddenly, out of nowhere, a massive mace struck Gabamaru right in the face, sending him flying through the air. It was Kan who had thrown the mace, and he quickly retrieved his iron ball. He taunted Gabamaru for letting his guard down, but despite the powerful blow, Gabamaru was still alive. Sajiri rushed to check on him, and he informed her that he had a dislocated neck. 
It turned out that Kaon was a warrior monk with an obsession for weapons. He had hunted down hundreds of warriors to steal their various weapons. Gavamaru pointed out to Sajiri that Kaon's hands were not tied, and she questioned her superior, Kisho, about it. Kisho simply said they could tie their hands on the way back and that he didn't want to waste time arguing with a prisoner about it. Gavamaru actually agreed with Kisho, and Kisho took the opportunity to assert that Sajiri was the lowest-ranking executioner because she was too honest. Meanwhile, Kaon struck one of his deadly objects downward, annoyed that Gavamaru didn't recognize him at first. He then showed off his box full of weapons and expressed excitement about trying them out. Gavamaru tried to reason that it wouldn't make sense to fight and give advantages to the others, but Kaon had different ideas. He believed it was better to deal with the criminals first and then take his time searching for the elixir. Kisho waited to see how the fight would unfold, but Gavamaru was annoyed at the thought of having to hurt someone again, knowing his wife didn't like it. Then, Kaon charged toward Gavamaru, and Sajiri touched his shoulder, insisting that he tie his hands to fight. The giant's first attack hit Gavamaru successfully, but his weapon shattered upon impact. Undeterred, he quickly grabbed another weapon, but it met the same fate when it struck Gavamaru. Gavamaru, while continuing to tie his hands, calmly faced each of Kaon's weapon strikes. Even when Kaon used a ball and chain, it too shattered upon hitting Gavamaru. Finally, Kaon charged with his spear, but Gavamaru, with his hands nearly tied, managed to deflect the attack and sent Kaon flying. All of Kaon's weapons fell to the ground, useless. Gavamaru complained about how difficult it was to fight with tied hands, but surprisingly, Sajiri was impressed that the situation had been resolved with a single blow. However, everyone was left astonished when Kaon got up, laughing. He revealed that his armor was directly fused to his skin, and when his mask fell off, it exposed his ugliness. In a scene change, it was clear that by the end of the battle, Gabamaru had wreaked havoc and brutally defeated the giant of weapons. Remarkably, Gabamaru was still tied up and without a single scratch on him. Gabamaru turned to Sajiri and suggested they start searching for the elixir to make up for lost time. He looked at her with determination, but she couldn't help but stare at his still-bound hands. Kisho, one of the executioners, drew his sword and swiftly clapped Kaon. He carried Kaon's head back to show that he was indeed dead and bid them farewell, expressing his excitement about finally going home for a hot bath. He made it clear to Gavamaru that they weren't enemies or allies. He was simply doing his job by retrieving the criminal's head. Sajiri, the fellow executioner, warned Kisho to be careful on his way back, considering that many had disappeared on this mysterious island. Kisho reassured her, saying that her real challenge was taking care of Gabamaru. As Kisho departed, he reflected on the chaos he had witnessed since their arrival on the island. Some criminals had formed alliances, others had tried to seduce their executioners, and some had already resorted to claping themselves. Izan, in particular, had met a grim fate, clapped by a giant prisoner in the forest. Before leaving, Kisho made a prediction that the situation on the island would change drastically in a few hours, with more than half of the criminals meeting their demise. He also informed Sajiri about rumors that the performance of the executioners on this mission would determine their future leader. With this information, Kisho left Sajiri with a final warning not to let her guard down against the criminals. Sajiri glanced at Gavamaru, reminding herself that he was a dangerous man, even though they had traveled without any issues for the past few days. She realized she still hadn't fully understood the true nature of Gavamaru. Suddenly, her thoughts were interrupted as Gavamaru launched an attack on her. She barely managed to block his strike in time and asked him what he was doing. His eyes were cold as he confessed that he had hoped to end her quickly and without causing her pain. As they clashed, Sajiri stared into Gabamaru's eyes, believing that she had finally uncovered his true nature. She reminded him that attacking her was against the rules. He explained that in this situation, his top priority was finding the elixir before the Iwagakure clan arrived to complicate matters. He admitted that he didn't hate her but saw her as an obstacle to his goal. Gabamaru continued his attack, and Sajiri found his reasoning and moral stance extreme and abnormal. She thought he should be clapped immediately, but for some reason, she hesitated, unsure why. At the same time, Gabamaru faced a similar dilemma. He knew he should have clapped Sajiri in that moment, given that his most crucial goal was reuniting with his wife. However, he couldn't understand why he hesitated, especially considering his wife's past advice that it's natural not to want to clap people. Gabamaru explained to Sajiri that he had once believed he had to get rid of his own emotions, that he was empty inside. But when she heard this, she playfully teased him, pointing out that he couldn't call himself empty when he blushed during a romantic moment. 
She emphasized the importance of being true to one's feelings and assured him that if he made decisions based on his emotions, she would support him no matter what. In that moment, Gabamaru remembered that it was his wife who had helped him realize he had feelings and emotions in the first place. With this memory in mind, we return to the present, where the ongoing fight between Gabamaru and Sajiri continues. However, Gabamaru fails to deliver the final blow when the opportunity arises. He realizes that his weakness has returned and knows it won't help him survive this trial, recalling the words of his village leader that had taught him to become cold. He breaks Sajiri's blade to make a decisive strike. Sajiri, however, blocks it with her scabbard. Gabamaru confesses that he doesn't care about the fate of other criminals, but claping her would hurt him. He asks her to allow him to end her peacefully. Sajiri, skeptical that he still possesses feelings of sympathy, watches as he struggles to finish her off. The dark apparition of his village leader urges him to be ruthless. But in the end, the essence, thought, or mystical apparition, Whatever it may be, of Gabamaru's wife appears, and he stops short of eliminating Sajiri. At this moment, Sajiri recognizes that deep down, Gabamaru is not truly empty. He's a product of his environment, but he's a human with emotions as well. Shortly after the emotional moment, Gabamaru starts crying and calls himself weak for not being able to clap Sajiri. But she comforts him and explains that it's not weakness, it's actually the beginning of strength. She tells him that avoiding emotions is like pretending problems don't exist, and she knows this because he indirectly taught her to face her own inner struggles. Sajiri gets up and tells Gabamaru that she'll overlook his past misdeeds. She challenges him to confront his crimes and emotions so he can reclaim his life. She expresses her desire to be by his side to see if someone like him can have a normal life. Afterward, she acknowledges that their relationship hasn't fundamentally changed. But Gabamaru is not the same person he was before. Gabamaru accepts her words, recognizing that they echo what his wife once told him. Meanwhile, we shift our focus to Fuchai and Tamiya, who are surprised to see statues on the island, indicating that there was a civilization there in the past. As they observe this with both amazement and confusion, Tamiya notices a butterfly perched on his hand, but it stings him. Instantly, he remembers the man with flowers growing from his body. With this memory in mind, the swordsman makes a quick decision. He removes his own hand without hesitation to prevent the venom from spreading through his body, and destroys the creature. Shortly after, they witness flowers starting to grow from his severed hand, and other strange creatures emerge, including a giant with hands for eyes. Back with the main team, Gabamaru and Sajiri confront a fish-headed monster. Gabamaru doesn't hesitate to put on his mask as he prepares to fight the menacing creature. In a flashback, Fuchai and Tamiya arrive on the island using a raft. They chat about their lives, with Fuchai warning Tamiya not to disrespect the Yamada clan. Then, they venture into the forest. Tamiya shares his plan to eliminate the competition and find the elixir all by himself when they suddenly encounter the butterfly and the giant monster. Fast forward to the present, Gabamaru and Sajiri find themselves facing many huge insects, and Sajiri is understandably scared. However, Gabamaru springs into action immediately and starts battling the fish-headed monster. He warns Sajiri to stay back and, after getting injured by the monster, realizes they need to run. But just as they attempt to escape, more bizarre and giant monsters appear. Gabamaru uses his fire ninjutsu to take down several of these monsters, but Sajiri is cornered by one of them. She's still in shock and can't react in time. Despite not wanting to do it, Gabamaru manages to save her. Yuzuriha and two executioners arrive on the scene to help. After the battle ends, Yuzuriha admires Gabamaru's skills, having seen him defeat so many monsters on his own. She even tries to seduce him, but it doesn't work. They share information about the creatures on the island, and Yuzuriha and Gabamaru decide to form an alliance. Meanwhile, Sajiri realizes that she hasn't made any progress since arriving on the island. The stress of the situation and inhaling spores from the butterflies take their toll on her, and she faints. In another part of the island, Toma and Chobai arrive in search of the elixir of life. They have a backstory. Toma managed to join the Yamada clan and become an executioner to accompany Chobai. As they journey through the island, they encounter various monsters. Together, they team up to fight off these creatures and continue their quest for the elixir of life. Sajiri wakes up from a dream and exits the cave where she was resting. She finds Gabamaru preparing food for everyone. They have a discussion about the island, and Gabamaru mentions that while searching for ingredients, he discovered something intriguing. He explains that most of the island's flowers and vegetation appear normal, but some grow out of bodies. They speculate about the monsters they've encountered, suggesting that they're half-animal, 
Half-humanoid appearances might be linked to contact with supernatural substances, possibly connected to the elixir. Gavamaru believes this indicates the elixir could be on the island. Later in the afternoon, Genji meets with Sajiri and advises her to leave. He thinks she's not up to the challenges of the island and suggests she return to her role as a woman in the Asiman clan and have children to ensure the clan's lineage. During their conversation, Senta joins in and advises Sajiri to stay because history shows that none of the samurai sent to this island ever returned alive. Genji leaves, and Senta adds that Gabamaru seems to have a soft spot for her. In case he becomes violent or loses control, Sajiri could either calm him down or defeat him. Meanwhile, in another location, we meet Tenza and Nyurugai. They haven't yet set foot on the mysterious island but choose to return on a small boat. Suddenly, tentacled creatures attack them. In the chaos, Nurugai feels like she deserves to perish here as punishment for inadvertently causing her family's death. However, Tenza convinces her otherwise and rushes to protect her. They manage to defeat the monster and escape on a raft to reach the island's shore. Afterward, they dry off and wash up, and Tenza is surprised to discover that Nurugai is a girl. She playfully suggests that he should propose to her when they leave the island, and they set out on a mission to find the elixir and return to live peacefully. That same night, Sajiri and Gabamaru have a deep conversation about self-discovery and life's challenges. As a result, the next day, she tells Genji that she will stay because she wants to improve. Genji doesn't take this decision well and decides to attack her, but Sajiri manages to dodge his attack. However, suddenly, a giant appears and severely injures Genji. This giant is the same one who had eliminated his fellow executioner, Izan, shortly after their arrival on the island. In a flashback, they learn that this giant, named Rokiroda, was born as a large child with incredible strength from an early age. He could easily clap people effortlessly. Back in the present, Rokiroda strikes a part of Genji's body, sending him flying. He then tries to harm Sajiri, but Gabamaru steps in, delivering a powerful kick to the giant's face. Sajiri rushes to help her gravely wounded comrade, whose body is partially destroyed. Meanwhile, Gabamaru faces Rokiroda in combat, realizing that his opponent's body is incredibly strong and resilient. His attacks don't seem to do any damage to the giant. In parallel, Sajiri does her best to stop Genji's bleeding, but he tells her it's futile as his injuries are too severe. He encourages her to choose her own path, acknowledging her courage as a man and her sensitivity as a woman. He hands over his sword to her, signifying his recognition of her as a samurai. Afterward, she joins the battle against the giant, supporting Gabamaru in the duel. Sajiri manages to clap off one of the giant's fingers, but they quickly realize that the giant's skin is impossible to slice. In the middle of the intense battle, the giant beast grabs Gabamaru and slams him to the ground. Luckily, Gabamaru manages to stand up, but his body is bleeding from the massive damage. The giant attacks again, but this time Sajiri steps in to protect her comrade. In this crucial moment, she uses her pure reasoning and precise strikes to deflect the powerful blows of the beast. Gabamaru also gets back on his feet, and together with Sajiri, they come up with a plan for a combined attack to end the battle. Gabamaru uses his fire ninjutsu, launching multiple fiery projectiles at the giant. Although these attacks don't hurt the giant, they ignite the trees around them, creating a smoky atmosphere. The giant starts to struggle for air due to the smoke, and when it falls to its knees, Gabamaru holds it still, allowing Sajiri to finish it off peacefully. Sajiri manages to control her emotions and calmly decapitates the giant, giving Rokiroda a peaceful death. Afterward, they escape from the spreading fire, but they see Genji in the distance, already lifeless and about to be consumed by the flames. Not long after, the island's creatures, known as Sashin, approach the fire, displaying their somewhat primitive mindset. Sajiri and Gabamaru continue their quest to find the elixir of life and come across Yuzuria and Senta, who had gone ahead. They all find themselves staring at a deserted village at the bottom of a hill, raising suspicions about what secrets this island holds. In another part of the island, Chobai and Toma, having defeated more monsters, talk about how the island is strange. They had expected to find gods or divine creatures, but it's filled with scary monsters. But then, things get even weirder. They come across two women who spot them and get ecstatic. One of the women says it's strange for humans to come this far, and she invites Toma and Chobai to their party. But her friend disagrees and finds it gross because they are just humans. Then, something really surprising happens. The woman transforms into a man and gets ready to fight Toma and Chobai. Meanwhile, the main group, still trying to figure out the village, meets a hooded girl. Gabamaru decides to chase after her to ask questions, but the girl runs away 
and they start a chase. During this chase, a strange man tree creature shows up to protect the little girl. So, the main group splits up. Yuzuriha and Senta face the monster, while Gabamaru and Sajiri continue chasing the girl. Eventually, they catch the girl, but she's not a normal child. She's incredibly strong. Even though Gabamaru is a bit mad, he manages to control her using some big vines he found nearby. But then, the girl starts crying, so Sajiri asks Gabamaru to let her go. After this, we witness how she tends to the child with a motherly touch, offering a warm hug to soothe the frightened girl. Following this, they cross paths with Yuzuriya and Senta, who successfully bring down the menacing monster. Suddenly, the tree creature speaks, proposing a deal, they can have plentiful food and valuable information about the elixir in exchange for releasing the girl. Quickly, Yuzuriya voices her doubts, stating they already possess enough supplies and fearing it might be a trap. The creature then tempts them with the promise of a rejuvenating hot bath to help them rest. Upon hearing this, Yuzuriya readily agrees, leading the group to follow suit and before long, they find themselves in the creature's quaint village. It reveals that it has inhabited this village for over a thousand years. Then, it points them in the direction of the baths, with Yuzuriha and Sajiri being the first to indulge. Afterward, the enigmatic creature imparts vital information, beginning with the confirmation that the elixir of life is indeed real. They are on an island called Kotaku, inhabited by supernatural beings and eternal entities. It continues, explaining that the sought-after elixir is known as Tan and the island is divided into three regions. The beach area is called Aishu, the central part is Hojo, and nestled in the heart of the island is Horai, where the Tan can be found. However, the creature warns that if they persist in their quest for this substance, they will soon cross paths with the Tensin, perfect and immortal beings tasked with eliminating intruders on the island. Meanwhile, in another part of the story, Chobai and Toma valiantly confront the man they encountered earlier. Unfortunately, their efforts prove futile as this man is revealed to be a Tensin, rendering him immortal, and he effortlessly defeats them. After doing that, he tosses them into a pit that has a strange power to turn people into flowers. Thankfully, they survive the fall, although they're pretty banged up, and they waste no time getting ready to get out of that deep hole. Back with the rest of the gang, the tree monster talks about how folks who turn into flowers down in that pit become the stuff they call tan. Then, it says it spilled the beans because it cares about them, and when they bump into the tensin, things might not go so well. After that, the creature says its name is Hoko, and the girl with them is Mei. Next, Gavimaru decides he wants a hot bath, and Sajiri tags along to make sure he doesn't try anything sneaky. When they reach the bath spot, they run into Mei who is planning to bathe too. She gets all jittery when she sees them, but Gavimaru doesn't make a fuss since he's used to sharing baths, thanks to the public one back in his village. So, Sajiri figures out that both Gavimaru and Mei don't really know how to scrub themselves proper, and she steps in to help them unwind. While she's washing them up, Gabamaru starts thinking about how his wife used to do this for him back home. She always said he needed to rest up properly if he wanted to be ready for big fights. After the bath, Gabamaru notices he feels all refreshed, but he doesn't waste time. He's got one thing on his mind, getting back to his wife as fast as possible. Then, a flashback takes us into Tenza's past, revealing his life before becoming an Aseman. Tenza was a kid who had a rough time in his village. People treated him real bad, calling him names as they walked by. He tells the story of his family being poor, with parents who didn't care about raising him. So, he had to fend for himself. For a big part of his life, he lived as a sort of small-time thief, swiping food whenever his tummy rumbled. That was his way, and he thought it meant freedom. But then, one day, he ran into some sword fighters itching for a brawl. Tenza, surprisingly, took them down. They got so scared, begging for forgiveness. Tenza figured he should keep teaching them a lesson, but someone from the Aseman group showed up and stopped him. Back to the present, we see Nurugai and Tenza strolling along the beach, hoping to find a current that'll lead them off the island. After a long walk, they realize they're just going in circles. Nurugai tells Tenza that wandering without purpose won't help them. He suggests that going into the jungle is risky business, but now that he knows Nurugai is a girl, he's all cautious about danger. When Nurugai hears this, she teases him, saying they should hurry so he can marry her. Tenz is not so sure, saying it's too soon for all that, and they should at least get out of this weird place first. But Nurugai doesn't seem to be listening and keeps on praising Tenza's tough side. Suddenly, they both feel like there's somebody right next to them. When they turn their heads, they see a person just appeared out of nowhere on the shore. Now, it's time to meet Yu Jin, a Tenson, who showed up because something seemed really wrong in the area. 
Ju Jin mentions finding a bunch of monster corpses called Sashin but can't figure out who's behind it. So, Ju Jin turns to Tenza and asks if he's to blame. Tenza gets a bad feeling from this person right away. His hunch turns out to be true when this individual changes from a woman to a man in the blink of an eye. Without thinking twice, Tenza and Nurugai decide to make a run for the jungle. But the Tenzin says it's pointless and then, boom, he's right in front of them, sending Tenza flying with a powerful attack. Next, Zhu Jin tries the same move on Nurugai, but she's quick on her feet and dodges the punches. Zhu Jin notices her agility and says she's pretty good for a human. Nurugai heads over to help Tenza, and Zhu Jin tells them he's gonna get rid of them because he hates troublemakers on the island. Just when Zhu Jin's about to attack, Tenza steps in, slicing at the Tenzin's eyes with his sword. The creature realizes what happened, praising the speed of a human and how fast Tenza is. But here's the shocker, Tenza's cut doesn't seem to hurt Zhu Jin much. The cut part just grows back. So, Tenza gets out of there fast and tells Nurugai to stay sharp. After a quick chat about their escape plan, Tenza goes back in for a slash, all proud of his speed. They both bolt toward the jungle, but the Tenzin is right on their tail, reminding them that running away won't work. Right when Zhu Jin was about to lose it, Tenza's master, Shen, shows up. He uses his sword to chop off the villain's head, which keeps growing back. The three of them manage to make a clean getaway. While they're dodging plants and all sorts of stuff, Nurugai wonders how Shen can run so fast, even though he's pretty much blind. Tenza spills the beans, Shen can sense things around him using his hearing and sense of smell. When everything calms down a bit, they stop, and Tenza formally introduces his master. He says Shin taught him everything about sword fighting and calls him a super duper warrior. After the intro, Shin gives Tenza a good talking to for not clapping the bad guy the right way and tells him to focus more next time. Tenza points out how his master is still giving lessons even on this crazy island where they're being chased. Then, Shin says he's done his duty on the island and wants to go home. He's about to hop on a raft when he realizes there's no current leading out, but he found one. To make things worse, he senses a scary creature lurking nearby. So, he decides to find his buddies first and then they'll look for a way out and deal with whatever they gotta fight. When Tenza hears this, he's all pumped up because that's what he and Nurugai were up to. They suggest teaming up to find an exit. But Shin says they gotta deal with Nurugai first since she's a criminal, and it's his job. He explains that executioners like him are supposed to take out troublemakers and keep order. He spills the beans about how his last assigned criminal tried to trick him, so he had to get rid of her. Now, they say they gotta clap Nurugai, but Tenza isn't having it. He wants to help her out. They have a little back and forth, and Tenza makes some pretty good points. After a quick chat, Shin decides to let Nurugai come with them. Then, Shin thinks about how at the start, Tenza didn't care about anybody but now he does. He's glad his pupil has grown. Nurugai says thanks and calls Shin master, but he tells her not to do that just yet. He hasn't taught her a thing. They start talking about how to deal with or get away from Zhu Jin. And right then, the Tenzin shows up ready to rumble. Shin doesn't waste time and grabs his buddies to shield them from Zhu Jin's attack. But the Tenzin manages to slice Shin's neck, nearly chopping it off. A bit later, Tenza figures running won't help because that thing will track them down. So, he gets his sword ready to take on the enemy. But this time, Zhu Jin dodges all of Tenza's moves, saying she's gotten used to his speed. But Tenza's got a trick up his sleeve and lands a hit on Zhu Jin. The result, though, is the same, and a moment later, the creature strikes back, causing fatal wounds to Tenza with some super duper powers. After this, we see a scene from the past where Tenza asks Shin why he picked him as a student. Shin says he saw potential in him and wanted to help him become a great swordsman. They keep on training, but Tenza's getting pretty frustrated because he can't even land a single hit, and his sword skills are basically zero. Shin sees his student's feelings and tells him that if he keeps training with discipline, his talent will start to show. But Tenza's not buying it. He thinks he's just no good because folks back in his village always called him trash. So, he tells Shin he wants to bail and live life on his own terms, without all this strict stuff. Shin says that's okay, but there's a catch. Tenza's gotta land at least one hit on him first. A few more days roll by, but Tenza's had enough of the challenge. He decides to leave anyhow. But then, Izan steps in and asks if Tenza managed to land a blow on Shin. Tenza thinks it's a load of nonsense and says he's leaving for real. Surprisingly, Izan doesn't stop him. He says Tenza can go, 
But first, he wants Tenza to go with him to visit a place. Tenza agrees, and they head over to a cemetery where Shin's old student's tombstone stands. Right then, Tenza learns that in the past, the old student didn't really commit to learning because Shin didn't pay much attention to him. So, the student left the dojo. When they met again, that young guy had turned into a bandit, and Shin had to do something really tough. He had to take that guy's life. Izan tells Tenza that the young man's final words were an apology to Shin. And as often happens, it had a big impact on the swordsman, making him promise to dedicate himself to teaching. Izan gives Tenza a serious warning. He tells Tenza that if he leaves without at least landing a hit on his master, he might end up like that young guy from the past. And Shin doesn't want that to happen. Then, Izan repeats it. If Tenza wants to go, he has to land a blow on his master. From that moment on, Tenza really buckles down in his training. He works super hard, even sparring with his master. While he's training, Tenza wonders when the time will come when he's got something truly important to protect. Now, let's shift back to the present. Tenza's hurt, and he sees that both Nirugai and his master are in big trouble. Quick as a flash, Tenza gets up and starts hitting his opponent like crazy. Right then, he figures out that his one and only job is to protect his friends, even if it means risking his own life. So, Tenza takes on Zhu Jin like a real hero. Shin wants to help, but he gets what Tenza's trying to say with his last words. He wants Shin to run away with Nirugai. Shin realizes the danger and does what Tenza asked. Tenza keeps fighting, even though it's tough. But after a while, Zhu Jin takes Tenza down, admiring his bravery. Meanwhile, Nurugai is crying and yelling at Shin, asking why he didn't help Tenza. Shin explains that the creature was way too strong, and it would have been disrespectful to Tenza, who gave up his life to give them a chance to get away. He says that at that moment, there was nothing they could do, but he promised to avenge Tenza's death someday. Now, let's go back to a scene from the past. After a super tough training process, Tenza finally manages to disarm his master and asks him to keep on teaching him. Shin smiles and agrees. But for now, we're back in the present, and it's really sad because we see Tenza's lifeless body. Now, on the flip side, we've got Senta dealing with a real mental tangle. All that info he soaked up in Hoko's place has him all kinds of confused. Sajiri sees he's struggling and tells him to take a breather. It's pretty obvious he's on information overload. So, he takes her advice and rests. Later that night, he falls asleep right in front of Gabamaru, who's on guard duty. Gabamaru figures it's the perfect chance to sneak into the Horai area, even though Senta told him it's a bad idea without a solid plan. But Gabamaru is all about not wasting any more time. He's ready to step forward. He marches through the thick fog leading to Horai and runs into some tree-like creatures that look like Hoko. They're singing these weird songs that catch his attention. Still, he keeps on toward his goal, not realizing Mei is quietly trailing behind him. After a bit, he gets to the Horai gates and gears up to go in. But then, he senses someone behind him. He doesn't know who it is, but he's got a hunch they're not human, so he asks them to reveal themselves. Zhu Jin got all bothered by Gabamaru just popping up, and she's like, go away. I don't want to deal with another person. Gabamaru, though, before hearing her say that, asks her if she's turning folks into that elixir of life stuff. That makes Gabamaru super cautious, and Zhu Jin gets all mad and ready to fight. It's a showdown. Right then, Zhu Jin's like, whoa, my arm's broken. After that, Gabamaru jumps in and kicks her neck. But guess what? Both of them heal up super quick, and the place gets wrecked as they fight. Gabamaru, while seeing all this crazy healing and strength, figures out she's one of those Tenson folks. So, he uses his fire move to burn her up and then looks at the door to keep going. But, bam, he gets attacked by the crispy Tenson, who smashes him into the door. Then, Zhu Jin changes into a dude and thinks he accidentally clapped Gabamaru, who he thought could make more of that elixir. But surprise, Gabamaru's still standing. Gabamaru asks if he's one of those Tenson he heard about but no answer. So, they start fighting. While all this goes down, Zhu Jin's wondering how Gabamaru can take his hits, but Gabamaru ain't telling. He just wants to know where that elixir is. Tenson stays quiet, not saying a word. Gabamaru realizes that the punches and kicks he's throwing aren't as strong as he thought. He notices that fighting this Tenson head-on is risky because she's super strong and can't be hurt easily. Gabamaru's like, huh, that kick I did earlier made her spit out blood. That's weird. He's puzzled about it. 
But then, the Tenson turns back into a woman and shoots this invisible energy blast from her hands. It hurts Gabamaru bad, but he's tough, and he's thinking, can I win this? Then, he thinks about his wife, which gives him the strength to push through the Tenson's attacks. He gets close to her and says, I gotta go home, no matter what. So, Gabamaru starts throwing punches super fast, even faster than she can heal. Chu Jin ends up on the ground all messed up. Gabamaru's like, tell me where the elixir is. But the Tenson just laughs, and flowers start growing on her. Before passing out, the Tenson says they'll scold him again. Then, tons of flowers burst out of her, and Gabamaru sees her turn into a flowery monster. Now, he's trying to stay still and figure out how to deal with this floral monster in front of him. The changed Tenson starts shooting lightning at Gabamaru, and it's super tough for him. He can't use his fire ninja stuff or dodge. It's like he's in a big jam. Gabamaru starts wondering if all this stuff happening on the island is real or just a bad dream as he starts losing consciousness. Later, Gabamaru wakes up in his bed next to his wife, and she's worried cause he had a bad dream. A tear comes out of his eye as he thinks it was all just a dream. His wife gives him some chrysanthemum tea to make him feel better, and he smiles, thinking even if it was a dream, he's happy to see her. He says sorry cause he can't come back to her in real life. But back to now, Gabamaru's getting choked by the transformed Tenson. Then, he remembers what his old leader taught him, keep fighting no matter what. So, he uses this power called Higoshi and burns the flowery tentacle that's got him. But he's really hurt and can't stand up. Suddenly, Mei shows up and uses her power to make a bubble thing that takes Gabamaru far from the fight with Zhu Jin. As the Tenson changes back to normal, she's wondering why Mei did that. Back in the village, Senta tells Sajiri he's sorry cause he let Gabamaru escape and is ready for whatever happens. He tried looking for Gabamaru but got lost in the fog. Hoko says it's impossible to go beyond where they are right now. Sajiri says they should look for Gabamaru in Horai, but Yuzuria thinks Gabamaru's on his own. She tells Sajiri that an Asiman shouldn't worry about criminals, and Sajiri doesn't know what to say. The tree monster notices Mei has gone too, so it decides to help them reach Horai, thinking Mei followed Gabamaru. Then, Yuzuria finds out Hoko can guide them through the fog, so she changes her mind and tells Sajiri she'll go look for Gabamaru with her. While they're traveling, Yuzuria talks about how tough it'll be when they get to Horai and have to face the Tenson. She asks Hoko about them, and he says legends say they used to be one hermit who split into seven after mastering mystical stuff. The tree guy also talks about how his people turned into trees over a thousand years ago, and gathered in the Hojo area, hoping to get to Horai. He says his daughter was the first to change. He adds that the Tenson are like godly beings who pick who goes to Horai. Meanwhile, in Horai, the Tenson folks are having a chat about whether they like being male or female. They talk it out and seem pretty calm. Just when they were almost done talking, this guy Reen shows up and says they gotta talk about the folks who came to the island. He says these humans are different from the ones they met before cause they found a bunch of dead Sashin creatures. Then, Jufa gets all mad at Chu Jin for not paying attention and letting those humans get away, and also for losing to them. So, what does the Tenson do? He uses some invisible power from his hand and takes off Zhu Jin's head. Yikes, Reen tells Zhu Fa to chill and says they're like a family and should stick together. So, Zhu Fa listens and calms down before telling about the humans he sent to the Tan Well. But Reen, who seems like the boss of them all, warns Zhu Fa not to underestimate those humans or the ones who fought him. He thinks they could escape from the Tan Well, and he figures there might be more tricky humans out there. Then, he asks Zhu Jin if he managed to clap the human he fought, and Zhu Jin says yes. Even with all the problems, Reen's still confident and says he can handle anything. They all drink this stuff called Tan and toast to being together forever and to their master. And right then, Zhu Jin gets young again after drinking the elixir, and he's super mad. In a rocky valley, Gabamaru wakes up and thinks about the monster he fought earlier. He figures he might have a shot at beating them if he teams up with his friends. Then, he looks around and who does he see? It's the criminal Tamiya and his executioner, Fuchai. The big guy says Gabamaru looks really beat up and wonders if this is the end for him. They get ready for a fight, and Gabamaru stands on the edge of a brawl with these tough warriors. Tamiya keeps wondering if Gabamaru's gonna bite the dust because he's all bloody, and Gabamaru notices Tamiya's missing an arm. After a bit, the two crooks decide to test their muscle. But then, Fuchai butts in and says their scuffle doesn't make sense and ain't logical. He tells Tamiya they should get info from Gabamaru without offing him. Meanwhile, Gabamaru figures out these two warriors in front of him mean business. He can't take them in his current beat-up state. So, he switches gears and asks for an alliance. Tamiya, though, ain't buying it. He pulls his sword and stops just a hair's breadth from Gabamaru's noggin. 
but Gabamaru's chill about it. Tamiya wants to make sure Gabamaru ain't playing him and tells him he's a wimp. Fuchai gets curious and asks Gabamaru why he's making this ask. Both of them are surprised when Gabamaru spills the beans about these things called Tensin, though Fuchai ain't too sure if he believes it. Tamiya decides they should meet these Tensin critters Gabamaru mentioned. But Fuchai mentions that Gabamaru's their competition on this mission. Still, he's kinda itching to meet these immortal beings, cause he wants to take them apart. With their goals sorta aligning, Gabamaru, Tamiya, and Fuchai make an official team up. So, Fuchai says Gabamaru should spill more info, and he's getting ready to talk about Mei. But right in the middle of all this, Gabamaru's jaw drops when he sees Mei's grown a bit and hears her say his name. He's pumped and asks her if she knows how to beat the Tensin. Mei says it's something called Tao but can only give a quick rundown. She says Tao's both strong and weak, body and below the navel stuff. Just as she's about to spill more beans, a bunch of Sashin show up. Tamiya makes a bold move and goes after a bunch of those Sashin monsters, taking him down one after another. He figures that the best way to figure out Tao is by giving these creatures a taste of his fists. Then, there's this big guy carrying Mei on his shoulder, and she's leading the way while the monsters get closer. Gabamaru spots a different monster off in the distance among the Sashin and wonders what it might be. Now, let's switch to another scene. We see Sajiri's group strolling along and Senta, one of them, starts putting the pieces together based on what Hoko told them. He thinks maybe this island ain't the real paradise on Earth cause it seems like a jumbled up mix of religions and cultures made by humans. Senta's got a theory that the boss of this island wants to send the flowered up humans back to the mainland, which could be a clue to finding that elixir and getting out of here. After he spills his thoughts, Senta realizes he's talked a lot, but Sajiri gives him a pat on the back for being so smart. Now, the ninja lady in the group starts worrying if they can take on the Tensin foes who've been at this for over a thousand years. She's afraid Gabamaru and Mei might already be toast. But Sajiri's got faith. She says Gabamaru's alive cause all he wants is to go back and see his wife, and he won't croak before that happens. Soon after, Hoko breaks it down for the others. He talks about this thing called Tao, which is like a superpower present in everything in the world. He says the Tensin are the bosses of Tao and mastering it can make you like a god, with crazy strength, and the ability to survive nasty injuries. It's all about that yin and yang cycle stuff. In another scene, Narugai tries to sneak up on Shin with her sword, but he, even though he's blind, stops her with ease. This really surprises her. Shin then says he won't teach her how to use a sword, even though she wants to get back at Tenza. Narugai begs him to show her his way of fighting because she doesn't want the people she cares about to get hurt. Hearing her plea, Shin talks about how he can sense waves around him, which lets him see stuff even though he can't see with his eyes. He says you gotta balance your spirit, like having both anger and calmness at the same time, to feel these waves. Varugai gets it but knows she won't get this power right away. Still, she insists on learning how to use a sword. So, Shin reluctantly points out what she's doing wrong and shows her the right way to handle a sword. While he explains, he easily chops up a Sashin creeping up on them. Shin tells Narugai he won't be her teacher, but she can watch and learn while he fights. So, she joins him in taking on the other Sashin. At the same time, Shin thinks to himself that he's gotta get even better at his power if he wants a shot against the Tensin. Now, we switch scenes again. Kao Fa asks Mu Dan if the humans beaten by Ju Fa can escape from the pit. Mu Dan says it's pretty much impossible cause they'd be too weak to get out of that deep pit. Plus, the wall of humans all mushed together would stop him from escaping. Even though someone said it couldn't happen, Chobai, the bad guy, somehow escapes from that well with Toma on his back. When they're safe, Chobai spills the beans to Toma about his plan to get back at the Tensin. Toma's not thrilled cause he knows this is like a one-way ticket to doom. But Chobai thinks the Tensin have a weak spot in their lower bodies cause he saw one of them regrow stuff when he sliced them during their last fight. Toma's kinda impressed with Chobai's detective skills and says his brother's pretty smart when it comes to fighting to the death. Right then, they run into this monster who says he's a doshi, like the Tensin's right-hand guy. He was sent by the Tensin to check out what the humans are up to. The doshi tells him to get back to the well and become tan, but Chobai ain't having it. He's ready to face this dude. So, Chobai yanks the doshi's hands off, and the doshi has to defend himself and calls in the Sashin. While Toma takes on the Sashin, Chobai goes head to head with the Doshi. During the brawl, the Doshi doesn't think much of Chobai, like he can't handle Tao. But after a quick showdown, the Doshi sees a chance to really hurt Chobai by whacking his neck. And guess what? He does it. Toma's freaked out, seeing his brother on the ground all bloody. But Chobai doesn't stay down, he gets up and keeps on fighting. 
The Doshi starts freaking out when he sees that Chobai is regenerating super fast even though he's just a regular human. He also notices Chobai's Tao is shooting through the roof. So, they start round two of their fight. And during it, Chobai figures out all sorts of things about Tao until he's pretty sure he can beat the Tensin. The Doshi listens to this and gets scared cause the Tensin's power might get messed up. So, he decides it's time to take Chobai out. While they're duking it out, Chobai remembers how he had to mess up his own face to become a criminal cause he didn't fit in with the underworld. He did it to protect his brother. Then, Chobai goes for the Doshi's stomach and figures that might be the weak spot of these creatures. The Doshi starts getting serious and tells the Sashin to attack the human warriors. But when he looks back, he sees Toma has taken care of the other Sashin, which really surprises him. Unfortunately for the Doshi, Chobai learns how to use Tao too, and now he can see all that mystical energy stuff. With this new knowledge, Chobai beats the creature in front of him, and the battle ends. But Toma's worried about what's happening to his brother. At the same time, somewhere else, Tammy is still battling the Sashin, and he asks Mei if he's using Tao the right way. She says he's got a mix strength and weakness to get it perfect, but right now, he's just doing strength with more strength. The fight keeps going, and our heroes manage to take down quite a few of those Sashin monsters. But then, the head honcho of the monster gang, who's also a doshi, spots Mei and says he hasn't seen her in forever, not since she got kicked out of the Tensin Palace. Now, he wants to drag her back there. When Gabamaru hears this, he figures out Mei's a Tensin. But when he sees that Mei ain't keen on going with these guys, he decides to fight to keep her safe. The Doshi guy splits into two and gets ready to face Gabamaru while calling in these butterfly monsters that turn people into flowers. Tamiya also wants to join the fight cause he's got a bone to pick with those butterflies. But as the battle heats up, they're having a tough time cause the Doshi uses bugs and invisible power to mess with them. These creatures, who are the Doshi, explain that they're training to master Tao, and there are five steps to getting really good at it. The first four you can do on your own, but the last one needs a partner. They spill the beans that for the last step, you gotta get real close with someone of the opposite gender to unlock that mystical power. They also reveal that Mei used to be a Tensin, but she didn't have the full power, so the boss kicked her out. She had two choices, die or be a training buddy for the Doshi. She got marked and had to run away to avoid that fate. When everyone hears this, they know what's up, and they get ready for a fight. While all this is happening, Gabamaru's getting really mad as he thinks about his wife, who got marked just like Mei. The two Doshi turn into scary monsters and say it's time to get down to business. After a tough fight where they can't land a hit on the monsters, Fuchai tells Gabamaru that he's got a mixed strength and weakness to really use Tao. Mei shows him how to do it, and finally, Gabamaru gets the hang of it. When Mei sees his energy, she's like, well, you've got a lot of power. Then, he senses the monster's Tao and seriously hurts one of them. The Doshi guys realize this guy figured out Tao super fast, and just before they get taken out, they notice that Gabamaru's Tao is like the Tensons. Gabamaru takes care of these monsters and says they're all set to go up against the Immortals. After the fight, the beaten Doshi spills the beans that the boss Tenson told them to keep an eye on the intruders to see if they're a threat. He says they didn't mess up, but right after saying that, both Gabamaru and Tamiya take him out. Gabamaru says he's figured out the Tao trick but needs a little more practice to master it. At the same time, somewhere else, Sajiri's group gets to the Tensin temple and meets one of them. This Tensin wastes no time and chops Hoko's head off right away. Upon witnessing these events, shock ripples through everyone. Yuzura, sensing danger, makes a quick attempt to escape but finds herself swiftly captured by the enemy. Sajiri, maintaining a vigilant stance, carefully assesses the unfolding situation. Hoko steps in to provide some clarity, explaining that the mysterious figure responsible for this turmoil goes by the name Mudan and is counted among the Tensin from the temple. Upon hearing this revelation, Senta's eyes widen in surprise, while Mudan sports a subtle, thousand-year-old grin. The Tensin proceeds to drop another bombshell. Hoko is destined to undergo a transformation into a tree. Hoko, in contrast, appears quite thrilled, hoping that this transformation will lead his soul to enter Horai. However, Mudan dispels this hopeful illusion, exposing the grim truth that the entire concept of humans turning into trees and the religious beliefs surrounding it were fabricated by the Tensin. This revelation shatters Hoko, who resembles a tree-like figure. Mudan takes it a step further, summoning modified humans who serve as his obedient warriors. They quickly subdue Yuzura, casting menacing threats at the others. Mudan finally provides an answer to the hero's burning question, revealing that the fabled elixir of life is nothing but a myth. He adds that the tan, the elixir, serves only the Tensin, as consuming it would turn a human into a tree like Hoko, 
rendering the quest pointless. Later, a moment of unexpected courage sees Yuzuria freeing herself and launching a fierce attack on Mudan. She then turns to Sajiri, urging her that they must make their escape. Sajiri, still processing the situation, is struck by the realization that Gabamaru's hope for an official pardon may never come to fruition. Yuzuria reminds her that, for now, their primary goal is survival, a vital step to ensure she can aid her comrades, a task she can only fulfill if she remains alive. Mudan, the tricky foe, quickly regenerates after Yuzuriha's attack, nearly catching her. But Yuzuriha swiftly dodges, impressing Mudan. He sees potential in her and suggests teaching her the ways of the Tao. He explains that if she succeeds, she'll gain great power, but if she fails, she'll end up as raw material for Mortan. Just then, Senta and Sajiri step up, ready for a fight. A fierce battle unfolds. Senta manages to slice the enemy, while Yuzuriha uses her powers and skills to do the same. However, the Tensen points out that Yuzuriha's techniques, while showcasing the potential of Tao, are too weak to hurt him. The gap between a human and a god is just too wide. The duel rages on, and Mudan proves to be stronger. But Hoko gives Sajiri a crucial tip. Attack the Tensen's abdomen, where the Tao flows from. Sajiri lands a blow there, but Mudan mocks her, sensing no Tao within her. Suddenly, Sajiri makes a devastating upward slice, forcing Mudan to retreat. As he looks at her, he realizes she can muster a significant amount of mystical power in a moment, a dangerous discovery. Everyone sees that Sajiri's wound on the Tensen isn't healing and she remarks that if the energy protecting him is Tao, she knows how to harm him. She likens it to Gabamaru's aura. Mudan notes that Sajiri's energy seems poisonous to him, both intriguing and alarming him. He fears for his life but also hungers to see what kind of tan he can create with it if he defeats her. The battle rages on, and Mudan sets his sights on Sajiri, seeing her as the most dangerous foe. But the team doesn't give in. They stand their ground and manage to slice up Mudan as he moves around, putting up a tough fight. Mudan then transforms into a female form and attacks from above with air bombs, but the group skillfully dodges them. Sajiri, momentarily overwhelmed by the intense battle, freezes. However, Yuzuriha snaps her back to reality, reminding her that Mudan is not a god and that they can defeat him. Yuzura, with her sharp instincts, anticipates the technique Mudan is about to use, recognizing its similarity to her own. She declares she can counter it. She swiftly employs one of her ninja techniques to grab the enemy and bring them down. She signals Sajiri to do her part, and sensing the imminent danger, Mudan tries to defend himself. But then, Senta appears from behind and firmly holds Mudan, allowing Sajiri to strike the Tensen's stomach as planned, causing him to fall. They take a moment to catch their breath. Sajiri asks Senta why he helped Yuzuriha like that, hinting that he might have feelings for her. Senta explains that he admires Yuzuriha's freedom and how she lives. He confesses that he wanted to be an artist but had to follow the Asiman clan's teachings due to family rules. Yuzuriha is the first person who truly understands him, and he wishes he had her life. In a different scene, Gabamaru's group has triumphed over all the creatures. Gabamaru approaches Mei to express his gratitude and to learn more about the Tao. However, something is amiss. Gabamaru's energy seems different, and he starts bleeding, collapsing to the ground, shocking his companions. Near the Tensen Temple, Sajiri and Senta are suddenly interrupted when Yuzuriya calls out to them. She warns them that something strange is happening to Mudan's body, it's turning into a flower. But before they can react, Mudan attacks Yuzuriha. Fortunately, Senta steps in and takes the hit for her. Sadly, this means his own body gets infected, and flowers start sprouting from him. With no time to waste, Sajiri realizes that Mudan has transformed into a monstrous creature. They must prepare to fight once again, and this time, he seems even more dangerous. Just then, Shin and Nurugai enter the scene, ready to join the fray. Arriving just in time to rescue Sajiri and Yuzuriya from Mudan's assault, Shin instructs Nurugai to tend to the flowers growing on Senta. He then moves the two women to a safer place as he gets ready to confront the monstrous Mudan. Armed with the knowledge he's gained about Tao during his journey to Horai, Center remains in bad shape despite the removal of the flowers. Sajiri turns to Hoko for help, but Hoko sadly informs her that there's nothing he can do. Yuzuriya steps up to assist Senta by applying a salve to stop the bleeding. As Shin's battle against Mu Dan unfolds, Sajiri worries for her fellow Asiman. Nyurugai reassures her, saying that Shin won't give in to death easily. Shin manages to avoid Mu Dan's stingers and Tao attacks while inflicting wounds on the monster that don't heal. This confirms to Sajiri that Shin possesses the same type of Tao as her, capable of defeating the Tensen. 
However, as Shin continues the fight, flowers begin to bloom from the wounds inflicted by Mu Dan's stingers. He has to slash them away, losing a lot of blood in the process. Mu Dan mocks Shin for risking his life and clarifies that he doesn't intend to die but is ready to if it means defeating Mu Dan. Seeing Shin in danger, Sajiri prepares to join the fight, believing that she, Nurugai, and Yuzuriha can create an opening if they work together. Yuzuriha, however, can't participate due to her lack of strength. Nurugai hugs Yuzuriha and Sajiri believing that she can replenish their strength based on her and Chin's understanding of Tao. Sajiri starts feeling more energized, realizing the positive interaction with Tao, and rushes to Shin's aid. Both she and Nurugai are coated in Yuzuriha's mucus to protect themselves from Mu Dan's stingers. Sajiri tells Shin that they can only defeat a Tensin by striking their tandem. She and Nurugai will act as decoys while Shin goes for the finishing blow. Mu Dan targets Sajiri and Nurugai but fails to land a hit as they dodge his stingers and clap them down. Following Sajiri's plan, Shin slashes Mu Dan's legs to immobilize him and moves in closer despite Tao converted lasers and a barrage of stingers heading his way. As Shin slashes away the stingers, he's fueled by hatred and frustration over Tenza's death, determined to press on. He manages to get on top of Mu Dan, with Sajiri and Nurugai pinning the Tenzin's hands to prevent him from attacking. Shin gathers Tao into his sword, ready to bring it down and cut the tendons of both bodies. However, he hesitates when he realizes that the waves of Tao emitted aren't strong enough. With the stingers of Mu Dan about to come back, Shin realizes he has to stick to the plan. But then, Senta shouts to Shin, telling him to strike at the center, which is the plant ovule, because Mu Dan's Kishikai body is plant-like. Following Senta's advice, Shin slashes at the plant ovule, and something surprising happens. Multiple heads of Mu Dan are revealed. One of those heads is drawn to Shin's Tao, which is all about life and death. It wishes it could have told Rin about this before. In his final moments, as he turns into peony flowers from being destroyed, Mu Dan thanks Shin for ending his 1,000-year wait. After the battle ends, Sajiri and Shin worry about Senta, who is still suffering from his condition. Even though Yuzura has enough salve left, she suggests using it to heal Shin's injuries instead. She explains that it's too late to save Senta but tells him that he is free now to let go of his duties and spend his remaining time thinking about whatever he wants while she holds him. Hearing this, Senta imagines himself in Yuzuriha's arms and sheds a happy tear. His last thoughts are about being held by the person he admires. Shin decides they should move away from the area and assess the situation, a plan Yuzuriha agrees with. After mourning at Senta's grave, Sajiri thanks Yuzuriha for being understanding earlier. She believes that the only way to escape the island is for both criminals and executioners to work together. Not wanting to see any more of her comrades die, Sajiri makes a declaration that everyone on the island must make it out alive. Sajiri, Yuzuriha, Hoko, Shen, and Nurugai find refuge in a small house within Horai. Yuzuriha and Nurugai decide to change their clothes, while Shin gathers everyone to review what they know so far. They talk about how dangerous Tao can be when not used correctly. Yuzuriha brings up the elixir of life and doubts its existence. Sajiri, though, mentions Gabamaru's former leader's immortality due to the elixir. Yuzuriha speculates that the Iwagakure chief might have used Jinjutsu, an illusion technique, to control his people. She even questions if Gabamaru's wife is an illusion to manipulate him. Sajiri tries to stop her from speculating further, shocked by these ideas. Around this time, Chobai and Toma force the Doshi to guide them to Horai. Outside, Shin joins Sajiri as she reflects on the deaths of their comrades and Gabamaru. He thinks she's in love with Gabamaru, but Sajiri denies it. She says she pities the life he's led and believes he's not a bad person despite being labeled a claper. She hopes he'll reunite with his wife. Meanwhile, Gabamaru wakes up after fainting earlier and learns they're in a cave halfway up the valley wall. He can't remember much, only that he's Gabamaru the Hollow. He decides to go along with the people around him, either to gather information or, if they suspect something's wrong, to clap them. May notices something odd about Gabamaru's Tao, which hasn't fully formed at the top of his head. Outside, Gabamaru struggles to remember a memory of him and his wife together. In Edo, Yamada, Asim, and Shujin and a colleague receive a message from the Shogun, instructing them to head to Shinsenkayo to monitor the Vanguard party members sent there. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.